Good afternoon and welcome back from lunch. Please make welcome Matthew Garrett. Good afternoon. My name's Matthew Garrett. I'm a security developer at Core OS. We produce an operating system that's targeted at providing a secure environment to run containers. And there'll be a small amount of content that's directly related to my work at the end. And by small, I mean it's two slides. And I've got 84. So I'm going to plow straight on, since that's quite a large number of slides for a 45-minute slot. Today, I'm going to talk about TPMs. And firstly, we should probably define what TPMs are, because it's unfortunately the case that TPMs to many people in related fields are technological protection mechanisms, things that are there to uh, prevent you ripping DVDs or to uh, control access to certain resources. The interesting thing is that the TPMs I'm talking about can, in fact, be TPMs in this sense as well, so confusion is entirely warranted. The TPMs I'm going to be talking about are trusted platform modules. They are trusted in the sense of trusted computing. And the problem with trusted computing is there's very few people know what this actually means. The fact that a trusted platform module exists in your computer, the fact that you have a trusted computing stack, does not mean that your computer is fundamentally trustworthy, because what does trustworthy even mean? The tools that are available with trusted computing do not provide a binary decision. There is no part of your computer that uses the TPM to say, this computer can be trusted, or this user can be trusted. Instead, they're providing tools that allow you to make a decision about who to trust or what to trust. When trusted computing started becoming a thing in the early 2000s, we were concerned that this tooling would be used to uh, take that decision away from the users and the owners of systems, and instead puts that decision in the hands of others. And this resulted in it being called treacherous computing by some. The idea here is that your computer would, as opposed to doing what you wanted, as opposed to being there to serve you, would instead listen to other sources of information prioritize them over yourself, and then make decisions that were not in your best interest. So there were concerns about TPMs being used, for instance, to uh, implement DRM mechanisms that would allow you to implement the other type of TPMs. So you might, for instance, not be able to access certain websites unless you were running Windows. This didn't end up happening for a variety of reasons, most of which are technical, policy-related, and fundamentally uninteresting. So I'm going to ignore them. This makes life much easier. Instead, I'm going to talk about how the trusted computing platform actually works, how TPMs fit into this. So TPMs are a 28-pin chip. Uh, TPMs are available from several different manufacturers, and if they're in the 28-pin form factor, they all are the same size shape. You can basically swap out a TPM from one manufacturer and replace it with one from another manufacturer. They have the same programming interface if they're the same version. Version 1.2 TPMs are all compatible with each other. Version 2.0 TPMs should all be compatible with each other. One thing to note, um, version 1.2 TPMs and version 2.0 TPMs have an entirely different programming model, and software written for one will not work on the other. Right now, the majority of the software in the free software ecosystem around TPMs is very tied to TPM 1.2. Pretty much all shipping hardware has TPM 1.2, so this isn't too much of a problem as yet. The chip itself ranges in terms of basic competence. There are TPMs that are effectively 8051 microcontrollers, chips that would have been considered slow in 1981. But you've also got some which are reasonably feature-rich ARM devices running at several hundred megahertz. They've got a small amount of RAM. They've got a small amount of NVRAM to provide persistent storage of a small amount of data. We're talking about a few hundred bytes, maybe a couple of K. We're not talking about a significant amount of data here. 
And you've got some GPIO pins. Uh, so the TPM can, in principle, also be used to talk to additional devices. The TPM can even do some crypto. The TPM is able to sign things, and the TPM is able to decrypt or encrypt very small. We're talking, again, like a couple of hundred bytes worth of data. The TPM can do this very slowly. Asking the TPM to sign some data may take, depending on the specific TPM, remember I said that these range in performance from on the order of a megahertz up to a few hundred, but it is entirely possible for certain TPM operations to take upwards of 20 seconds, depending on your vendor. So when I say slow, we are not talking about slow in the sense of, goodness, it just took Firefox a second to render these five megabytes of random chunks of HTML and CSS and JPEGs and everything. We're talking slow in the sense of, I could work this out almost as quickly by hand. <laughs> so given that TPMs can do a bunch of things that your CPU can also do, there's kind of a question of, well, why do I have a device that is worse than my CPU in every single way? That's a great question. And it's one that I'm going to skip over for the moment and come back to. <laughs> so one thing the TPM has is uh, a set of registers internally. Depending on the version of the spec it conforms to and the precise implementation, you're looking at between 16 and 24 of these platform configuration registers. And these are used to do something called measurement. And when we say measure, the idea here is to look at the boot process and come up with a number that represents the boot process in a meaningful way. For honest, the TPM itself is a passive device. The TPM is not capable of doing DMA. The TPMs on the LPC bus, which is basically equivalent to a cut-down version of the old ISA bus, the TPM does not have any meaningful way to ask the operating system to do something for it, and it certainly can't go and do that itself. If the TPM wants something, the TPM has to wait for the operating system to tell us about it. So the TPM can't watch your system booting. The TPM can't go out there and grab this information about your boot process itself. Instead, the boot process needs to cooperate with the TPM. And this is done with something called the extend operation, which is performed on the PCRs. When you extend information into a PCR, you call the extend operand and you pass it a 20-byte hash of some data. Now, uh, TPM 1.2 devices, sorry, it's 20 bytes for TPM 1.2 devices because TPM 1.2 devices only support the SHA-1 hashing algorithm. That's getting to the point where it's potentially going to be broken in some not very interesting ways in the not too distant future and more comprehensively broken probably within our lifetimes. So TPM 2.0 moves on to using more useful crypto algorithms, but you know, I'm mostly talking about 1.2, so I'll stick with SHA-1 for now. So you take your data, and on the CPU, you calculate the SHA-1 of this data. You then pass that to the TPM. The TPM then takes the existing contents of the PCR, which are 20 bytes long, appends the SHA you just passed it to that, and then rehashes that down to 20 bytes again. So if you power on the system, the PCR to begin with just contains zeros. You have something that you want to measure into the TPM, you take the hash of it, and so we have this F1, D2, D2, which is, in fact, the output of echo, foo, pipe, SHA-1 sum. <laughs> the new value of the PCR will be the SHA-1 of 20 bytes of zeros followed by the 20 bytes of F1, D2, so on. So that means to obtain a specific PCR value, you have two choices. You can either break SHA-1, which, has anyone here broken SHA-1? 
No, that's great. Also, I'm very glad that if anybody here has, they have chosen not to admit it right here. That would probably be awkward. Or alternatively, you can perform exactly the same sequence of writes because the contents of the PCR cannot be set directly. I'm not able to change the value of a PCR from, say, all zeros to a specific value because the new value depends on the existing value as well as the uh, value that I'm writing to it. So that means that each component, uh, the implementation of this means that each component of the boot process measures the next component of the boot process before executing it. When you power on a modern Intel system, the management engine that measures the first stage of the system firmware and copies that extends that into a PCR on the TPM. The first stage of the firmware measures the second stage of the firmware. The second stage of the firmware measures any option ROMs. So if you have any plug-in cards, like a network card or a RAID controller, which contains drivers that's going to be executed, those drivers are also measured before being executed. The bootloader is then measured, and the idea is that the bootloader then measures the kernel, the initRD, or whatever, and then at that stage, you've got a bunch of PCRs that hold the full boot state. And if you know what you are expecting to boot, the PCRs will match that. If the PCRs do not match your expected PCR contents, that means that someone has tampered with some stage of the boot process. If someone replaces your kernel with a different kernel, then that PCR will contain a different value. If someone's replaced your bootloader, the bootloader PCR will contain a different value because when the firmware hashed it, it will have gained a different response, uh, sorry, a different value. And if anybody tampers with your system firmware, then this measurement will also change. So that's great. We now have a chip in the system that contains everything we need to know to determine whether your boot process has been modified or not. Now what? Like I said, the TPM can't actually go out and do anything with this information. The TPM cannot halt the system if these values aren't correct. The TPM cannot refuse to allow something to run if these values are something other than you expected. So in order to find out whether you got the correct values, you need to actually ask the TPM. And in order to ask the TPM, we need to, uh, well, how do we talk to the TPM? The TPM is a piece of hardware. It's built into the system, so we use the same thing that we use to speak to all our attached hardware. We ask the kernel. So we send a command to the kernel asking it to please read the PCR values from the TPM and give them back to us. The problem is, if the kernel's been tampered with, how do we trust that the kernel's giving us back the actual values from the TPM and isn't actually just giving us back lies? This is the fundamental question here. We're trying to prove that the kernel is trustworthy. In order to prove that the kernel is trustworthy, we have to ask the TPM. So this seems like a somewhat insurmountable problem, and, but there's actually a fairly straightforward way around this. We can't trust anything local for the most part because the TPM has no means of communicating with us. The TPM cannot take over the system and print the values directly on our screen. Instead, we can rely on a third party to do this for us, and then that third party can let us know. So this is a process called remote attestation. The TPM attests to a remote system that it's in a specific state. So first of all, you want to make sure that this remote system is actually talking to a TPM as opposed to something pretending to be a TPM. At manufacturing time, all TPMs are flashed with something called an endorsement key. Now, in principle, this endorsement key is immutable. Once the TPM has an endorsement key, that cannot be changed in any way whatsoever. The private half of this endorsement key never leaves the TPM. It's built into the TPM. Nobody, theoretically, has access to the private half of the endorsement key. 
There's also something called the EK certificate, the a certificate attesting that the endorsement key was produced by the TPM manufacturer. So you can ask the TPM for its endorsement certificate and it hands back a certificate that is almost but not entirely unlike an X509 certificate. <laughs> and you can verify that there's a chain from that certificate back to the TPM manufacturer. So as long as you have certificates that all the intermediate certificates for all the TPM manufacturers, which firstly, a lot of manufacturers seem to host these certificates in servers inside disused lavatories in a basement with no lighting over HTTP. And others just keep forgetting to upload new certificates when they start using new ones. So that's a little more difficult than you'd expect it to be. But in any case, you can look at the certificate, you can verify that the certificate chains back to the TPM manufacturer, and you know that you're speaking to a genuine TPM as opposed to a piece of software pretending to be a TPM. The endorsement key can't do a great deal. Most operations that the TPM can perform cannot use the endorsement key. Instead, you create something called an attestation identity key. Now, you do this by sending a command to the TPM asking it to please create an attestation identity key. And the TPM then provides two things back to you. It provides, well, three things, in fact. It provides the public half of the attestation identity key. It provides an encrypted blob that contains the private half of the AIK. And the reason it does that is that, like I said, the TPM has very little persistent storage. The TPM cannot store every key that it generates. Instead, the TPM generates a private key and then encrypts it with another key that only the TPM has and then gives it back to you. So you now have a blob. You can't do anything with that blob because it's encrypted with a key that's only in the TPM. So you have the private key, but the, it's like having someone's private GPG key that's been passphrase encrypted. You can't actually use it without knowing the decryption key that's inside the TPM, so it's unhelpful to you. And finally, it also gives back a verification block which is signed by the endorsement key. So you now have a key that chains back to the TPM manufacturer which verifies that only the TPM has that key and the TPM's generated a new key and the TPM signs that new key with the endorsement key. So that means you know that this AIK, the attestation identity key, came from the actual TPM. It's so great, we now have a key that can be used to validate this attestation process. And we now get on to another TPM operation, what's called a quote. A quote is a, effectively a signed copy of the PCR values. The TPM hands over the PCRs and it hands over a signature of the PCRs signed with the attestation identity key. Now since, remember from the chain, we know that the AIK is only under the TPM's control. That means that if we get back a copy of the PCRs signed with the attestation identity key, we know that they came from that specific TPM, the one that we gained the endorsement key from. So that makes it impossible for someone to just make up a correct set of, TPM, of, correct set of PCR values and then give them back to us. Instead, when we have a quote, we can verify the signature and then we know that these PCR values came from the actual TPM. It's a little more complicated than that because when we ask for the quote, we also provide a random value called a nonce, and then that value is incorporated into the signed data. And that means that it's not possible for a malicious actor to simply watch one remote attestation process and then capture a valid quote and then simply hand back the valid quote even after it's compromised the system. The nonces won't match, and so as a result, that quote will be rejected by the remote attestation server. So in this scenario, the remote attestation server now has a copy of the PCR values and it absolutely, it knows that those values came from an actual TPM. The kernel cannot interfere with that process. The kernel, the only thing the kernel can do is not, the only thing the kernel can do to interfere with this process is to refuse to hand the data over. And if you don't get an answer back, then the obvious thing to do is to assume that the validation failed. 
Otherwise, the kernel is never in a position to give you back untrustworthy data without being detected in the process. So, success. The remote system now knows whether or not my laptop is trustworthy. Now, this is perfect for cases where the remote system is then going to grant or deny access to some sort of resource. So, for instance, if I'm bringing up a cloud environment, I might want my compute nodes to provide a valid quote to the controller before they're allowed to join the cluster. So, in that case, that's okay. The nodes don't need to know whether or not they're trusted. Only the controller needs to know that. And so, remote attestation is sufficient. On the other hand, if I want to know whether my laptop's trustworthy before I start typing my passwords into it, I need to ask the remote system if I'm secure. And how do we do that? Well, we send packets with the kernel. Remote attestation is not particularly helpful here. We can imagine ways in which you could make this better. For instance, the remote attestation server could send you an SMS telling you whether or not your system is trustworthy. The problem with that is that, well, it's not very difficult to send SMSs, and it's not very difficult to block them either, so a sufficiently motivated attacker could simply block any SMSs that you're supposed to be receiving, saying, no, don't type your password into this computer and instead send you one which is basically just two thumbs up. <laughs> so ideally, because of this difficulty in having any real way for remote systems to communicate with a local user without setting up a basically identical trust pathway, and we've just established that that's very difficult, it's preferable to find some way to use the TPM locally. Now, like I said, this doesn't work well in terms of the TPM, of just asking the TPM to give us values. Instead, we have to make use of another feature of the TPM. And this is that, remember I said the TPM can encrypt small amounts of data. Not only can the TPM encrypt data like this, the TPM can encrypt that data such that the TPM will then refuse to decrypt this data unless you have a specific set of PCR values. And if the PCR values have been modified in any way because your boot process, boot process has been tampered with, the TPM will refuse to decrypt it. So if the decryption is successful, you know that the PCRs were correct. And the way this is most commonly used, uh, in fact, if you buy a recent system with Windows pre-installed, this will happen automatically out of the box. The disk is encrypted with a secret that is then sealed to the TPM. If you tamper with the boot process, the TPM will not decrypt the disk encryption secret, and so you can't decrypt the file system. So uh, you encrypt the secret, and if the system boots, then it wasn't modified. So that's good. That seems like a pretty straightforward thing to do. The fact that the system boots proves to us that the system has not been tampered with. If the system doesn't boot, then that might be because it's been tampered with, or it might be because your disks failed, or it might be because computers are terrible. <laughs> Downside to this is that, well, it kind of defeats one of the points of disk encryption. Fine, if someone steals your disk, your disk is still encrypted, and they can't do anything with that. But if they steal your entire laptop, all they need to do to get access to the encrypted data is turn on your laptop. This is suboptimal. So, obviously, we add a passphrase. The way that we normally use disk encryption on Linux is to require a passphrase, so that's great. Uh, but at the point where a screen pops up asking me to type in the passphrase, how do I know that that's legitimate? <laughs> what if someone's modified my boot process so it just prints something that looks like a login prompt, or sorry, a disk encryption prompt, and I then type in my passphrase, and then the system, if the boot process has been tampered with, at this point, the boot is going to stop at that point because it doesn't have the real decryption secret. The TPM would refuse to hand that over. Because we all know that computers are terrible, I type in my passphrase, and then this malware 
makes it look like my system is continuing to boot. I see the usual messages, I see the usual animations, whatever, and then, oh no, my computer crashes and reboots. So how many people here have never had a computer crash and reboot on them? Good. Um, that's reassuring. Zero hands went up, which is great. I would probably have had to either assume that you were lying or has never used a computer. <laughs> Otherwise, we're not very good at computers. It's a bit upsetting. So uh, we don't have, so far in what we've discussed, a good way of demonstrating that the boot process is trustworthy still. Uh, Joanna Rutkowska, who uh, is the lead developer on the Cubes project, introduced a piece of software called Anti-Evil Maze. And this is interesting, because rather than using the TPM to encrypt a disk encryption secret, you instead use the TPM to encrypt some other kind of secret, so just a phrase, some words. And then you display that secret on the screen on, at boot. Um, but the problem is, if you display it on every boot, someone who wants to interfere with your boot process can just boot your laptop, read the secret off the screen, and then embed that secret in their malware. So the malware now prints the expected secret. And you think your system's trustworthy, but actually it's not. So that's Using it that way is not ideal. It's too easy for anybody to obtain the secret because it's printed on the screen, which is not actually very secret. So instead, you can put it on a USB stick, and then you keep the USB stick on you, and if you have any reason to believe that your system may have been tampered with, you boot the system off the USB stick, you verify that it prints the correct thing, and then you know that you can boot it normally and type in your passphrase. That requires pretty good discipline. Uh, if you ever leave your laptop in a hotel room and then you come back, you want to boot off this USB stick. You have to remember to do this every time. If you don't get into that pattern, then someone can just compromise your system and you won't notice. So there's an alternative. What we want is something that can be displayed something that can be encrypted by the TPM, but something which is not static, something which varies over time. And this turns out to be basically exactly what we use in two-factor authentication with the TOTP process. So rather than encrypting a phrase, we instead encrypt the seed for TOTP generation. So TOTP is the time-based one-time password that's used with most uh, two-factor authentication things. If you've ever used a system where you have a six-digit number that changes every 30 seconds, that's TOTP. So we generate a TOTP seed, we encrypt it with the TPM and seal it to those PCR values, and then we also enroll that seed on a second device. So this looks something like this. I run the seal TOTP application, and it prints a lovely ANSI QR code. Now, oh, sorry, that's, that's working less well than I hoped. How about if I, oh, bother. Right, there we go. Um, okay, I should maybe make that a little bit smaller. Right. So now that you can't read any of that, this is a small application I wrote called Seal TOTP, which is part of the TPM TOTP suite. I'm just running that, and I'm telling it where to save the encrypted data. I run that, and it prints a nice ANSI QR code, and then you can scan that with any device that supports TOTP key enrollment. So excellent. By the way, I'm not using this one. <laughs> because otherwise, I've just allowed you to record that secret. That would kind of defeat the point. Uh, yeah, feel free to enroll it. You'll see that it has a vaguely cute message in it. That might be a lie. 
Great, so we have that secret now enrolled on a second device. Every time you boot, when you print the disk encryption passphrase prompt, you also print the current TOTP value. You then check that against the value on your second device. If the numbers match, then your boot process has not been tampered with. Or alternatively, someone has tampered with both your laptop and your phone. Try not to leave them both in the same place. So great. Then you can extend that to login, screen unlock, and so on. Any time you have to type in a new secret, you can have the system verify to you that it has not been tampered with. A couple of problems with this. The first is that, like I said, the entire point of this is that if someone modifies your boot process, then the PCR values change and the secrets won't be decrypted. There is a bunch of completely legitimate reasons for you to change your boot process. If you install a new bootloader version, if you install a new kernel, if you regenerate your initRD, if you do a firmware upgrade, all of these will change the PCR values and suddenly your secrets will not be decrypted. Awkward. Once the TPM has decrypted this, the decrypted secret is in RAM. So if anybody is able to do arbitrary DMA, for instance, if they're able to plug in a PCIe device, then they can just copy the secrets out of RAM. So you really want to have your IOMMU turned on. Unfortunately, most distributions still don't turn the IOMMU on by default because it tends to break Intel graphics. It's quite unfortunate. And finally, we have the problem of the Intel management engine. The management engine is a small micro controller, well, it's actually a reasonably full power controller, sitting on the CPU package, which starts executing before the CPU is running code, which pulls its own firmware, validates the signature on it, and then starts executing that. It's the management engine that does the initial verification of the, the initial measurement of the firmware. If you're able to get the management engine to execute arbitrary code, you can get the management engine to start lying about that initial measurement, which then means that none of the rest of the measurement chain can be trusted either. Your firmware could be tampered with and you'd still have correct values. The management engine that runs encrypted code is completely unauditable and we have no idea how secure it really is. So there's that. What about after boot? I've been concentrating on the boot process so far. Can we go further than this? And yeah, there's a kernel feature called the Integrity Measurement Architecture, or IMA. And IMA, rather than just giving up on the TPM after you've booted, with IMA enabled, every time you execute a binary, well, the first time you execute each binary, a measurement of that binary is pushed into the TPM. So you can then verify via remote attestation or, uh, that the local binary, that the binaries on your system haven't been modified, that nobody's been able to tamper with the file system contents. But remember I said the PCR value depends on you writing the correct values in the correct order. Even if you write, well, if you write A then B into the TPM, you'll get one value. If you write B then A, you'll get a different value in the PCR, even if well, A is still A and B is still B. Order matters. When you boot a system, you can't guarantee that all the executables will be executed in the same order, and you certainly can't expect that users will only execute the same commands in the same order every time they boot a system. So to get around this, there's something called the TPM events log, and the events log is a record of every measurement event. Whenever you measure a new thing, you add an entry to the log saying that you performed this measurement, this was the value that you extended into the PCR. If you then hand that log over as part of remote attestation, the remote system can replay the log. And if the replayed log gives the same value that the TPM gives you, and we know that the value came from the TPM because it's part of a signed quote, then we can verify that the, we know that the log is then 
correct. And we can look at the individual values in the log, and we can verify that each of those individual values is correct. So it's possible to make this work even if you don't have uh, a stable boot ordering or a stable ordering of executables. And finally, the bit where I actually talk about my employers a little, we can also measure containers. When you bring up a container, you can measure the container disk image into the PCR as well, along with the configuration of the container and the arguments that were passed to the container at startup time. And logging these in the same way as IMA does means that you then have a log of every container that was launched on the system that can be completely cryptographically verified. You can look back at this log and you can say, OK, I booted these containers on this system. And if anybody has tampered with the log in any way, you can then prove that the log was tampered with. The PCR values won't match. So that means that if you discover later that you have been using a container image that was perhaps vulnerable to some sort of external exploit, that logging allows you to verify which systems in your cluster launched that container image, and then you can go and examine those specific machines and determine whether they've been compromised or not. Uh, if someone has attempted to cover their tracks by deleting entries from the log or deleting the log entirely or adding fake entries to the log, the log will not match the PCR quote, and so you know that this has happened. You can then prove that the system's been tampered with. You can't prove what was run on the system. You only know that it was tampered with, so you're still going to have to do additional, in, additional investigation. So this functionality is incorporated in Rocket, the uh, CoreOS container runtime. Version 1.0 was released earlier today, so that's there. You can build that, and you can have your containers be measured into the TPM. Code for these components is available. Uh, so first of all, Linux IMA, there's some user space tools which are probably in your distribution. The code has been in the kernel for some time now, uh, but it's typically not enabled by default. The website contains documentation on how to set up and configure IMA. Rocket is, like I mentioned, a container runtime that incorporates TPM support. As I mentioned, the boot process has to do measurement of each following component, so you need support for TPM measurement in your bootloader. Uh, these two versions, uh, Shim and Grub, both con in my GitHub repositories, contain additional codes to do this. The aim is obviously to get these into the upstream projects, but as of yet, you're going to need to use my repositories if you want to deploy this yourself. And finally, TPM TOTP is the code base that I was talking about that allows you to do the TPM 2FA enrollment. There is uh, support in there to integrate with Plymouth and Draycut. If you want it to work on non-Fedora distributions, you'll probably need to do a little bit of fiddling yourself in order to integrate it into the boot process. But if anybody would like to see a demonstration of that later, uh, just find me and I can show you what it looks like in the real world. Anyway, we have just over five minutes left, so if there's anybody who has any questions, uh, Mark at the front here seems to have one. Do you know of any case where all this has ever actually caught malware in the wild? Do I know of any case? Uh, no. However, Several of the attacks that were used as part of the hacking team work. Uh, from what we know of attacks that were being deployed by hacking team, several of those would have been caught by this. And so I think there is an expectation that this is a meaningful mitigation technology. Anyone else? Over there? You've pushed a lot of measurement into the system. Mm -hmm. There's a point at which, obviously, you can't push back, which is the beginning of the Intel chip. Yes. Is anybody else working on projects that will help us to address those issues? 
So issues like how do you verify that your CPU itself is trustworthy? Yeah, uh, that's a great question, and that's a very difficult one to solve. Uh, there's certainly a point at which you have to assume that the device executing code is itself trustworthy, because how else do you measure this? Really, the only way that you can do that is to, in the long run, what we need is completely verifiable open hardware, but then you're still going to need some way to verify that the actual physical object that was put into your system was constructed according to the open specifications and that hadn't been tampered with. Solving this is very, very, very hard. On the other hand, the further back you push it, the more difficult it is for someone to attack. So I think that while this will not rule out anything, certainly if someone is able to compromise Intel, then none of this will save you. With luck, the number of people who can compromise Intel is fairly limited. And most of those are probably the US government. But yeah, the, there are still people who are not the US government who are trying to cause your day to be less good than it is. Uh, in your Grub implementation, what happens to the PCRs if the user drops through a shell? I'm sorry, um, at which point? Uh, during, during the Grub boot process, if the user interrupts it. Uh, the Grub boot process? Yes. Right, so the implementation that I have in Grub right now records every command that is executed in Grub into the TPM. So if someone adds additional commands in Grub, then the measurements will be different. Do you use the boot configuration PCR for that? No, I'm not using the boot configuration one because I didn't want to necessarily step on PCR values that other people might be using with different expectations. So I, at the moment, we're using uh, PCRs 8 through 15 for most of this stuff. And I, we probably need to come up with a better idea of allocation of these PCRs. Yeah, a little bit of work to do there, but we're definitely trying not to step on any established PCR usage. Someone down at the front here? Good evening. Um, just wondering, sort of in an ideal world, what features would you like to see in new boot processes that would make this kind of stuff easier? Is there anything, or are we kind of at a peak anyway? How could we make this easier? Uh, well, you could merge my patches. <laughs> then I wouldn't have to maintain them. That's, but, well, the aim is to do that, obviously. Uh, beyond that, one of the biggest problems that we still have is that we're measuring things that are directly involved in the boot process, but we're not measuring the state of a lot of ancillary hardware. For instance, this provides no mechanism for me to determine whether someone's tampered with the firmware on my hard drive controller, or sorry, on my disk itself. Like I said, IMA only performs a measurement of an executable when you run that executable for the first time because there's a performance overhead in doing this measurement. So if someone, um, if someone modifies it through the kernel, then that's not a problem because the kernel sets a flag that informs IMA that it needs to re-measure it because someone's replaced the binary. If the disk itself gives a different answer back when the kernel asks it for this data, then you'll execute untrusted code, but the measurements will still look fine. We have no mechanism at present to verify the state of the SSD firmware. And nobody has as yet come up with a particularly workable implementation that was allow us to do so. So that's going to be the next big challenge in this space, figuring out ways for users to verify that the rest of their platform is also trustworthy. Uh, with regard to the TPM itself, have you checked to see how robust it is, like against, you know, bad input from the kernel and stuff like that? I have not, because I'm kind of scared about what might happen. Uh, things get uh, even more interesting 
Uh, there's a gradual move in some cases to provide TPMs in firmware in order to avoid having to spend the money on additional hardware. So there is now a full TPM implementation running on the management engine. And so if you were to find a flaw in that, then you would also be able to execute code on the management engine, which is able to do bad things. So yeah, I, I do not know of many people, I do not know of anyone who has put real effort into fuzzing a TPM. If anybody has done it, they're not talking about the results as far as I know, which might mean that they found some really terrifying things. Or alternatively, they're just fine. Um, I can't say either way. Very sadly, that's all we have time for. Matthew, th th thank you very kindly for your talk. Thank you.